Welcome to this panel. Um, so uh, my name is Julia Hockenmeyer. I'm a professor here in computer science. I work on natural language processing. Um, and I have um, four of my wonderful colleagues and friends here. And I'm just going to let them introduce themselves real quick, uh, what their names are and what they work on. And, yeah, and we'll take it from there. My name is Mark Hasekawa Johnston. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering. I work primarily on automatic speech recognition and processing. Thank you. I'm Lana Lezebnik. I work on computer vision. Hi, I'm Katie Driggs Campbell. I'm an assistant professor over in ECE, and I work on robotics. Hello, everybody. I'm Arindam Banerjee. I'm a professor in computer science. I work on machine learning, including generative models, sequential decision making, and applications of machine learning in scientific problems. So as you can see, we've got a variety of different sort of application areas. Um, I'm represented on this panel, so, um, and that was on purpose. Um, I wanted to, uh, to understand what are the core challenges of your fields before we get into sort of how generative AI plays a role in this. So, I don't know, perhaps now we go the other way around? Or, so. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for sending the questions. I made notes. <laughs> Uh, so from the ML perspective, I'm going to give you two answers, one from the core ML perspective, one from the scientific applications of ML perspective. ML perspective, uh, a lot of the generative models, it's hard to imagine, but computationally it's a nightmare. I don't know how many of you have tried to make diffusion models work in practice. Uh, you, you need serious compute. So we, we need algorithmic work. We need better ideas on how to do these inference and learning and so on and so forth. So this has not changed. There's a lot of very active work going on in this field. So computational, number one. Second is statistical. We actually do not know if they are learning the right distribution. Right. You have, you have trained a model which to learn a distribution. We have no idea whether they're learning the right distribution. How many samples do you need? Right. What is the right algorithm? So we have no understanding of the theory at this point. The inference part is the most in the best shape because it's connected to you know, Langevin dynamics, stochastic partial differential equations. There's a, there's a rich body of work. But there's still neural networks in there. right? There's still samples in there. So we actually do not know the theory part of it. Computational, number one. Number two, statistical. Number three is constraints. I work on scientific problems. If you are generating images, video, graphics, they often don't need to satisfy constraints. The domains I work on, they need to satisfy conservation laws, other constraints in there. So you cannot just generate whatever you feel like. right? I'm, so which is my, brings me to a fourth point, which is that I want to generate Atlantic hurricanes in a scientifically correct way, things which have not happened. I want to generate forest fires in a scientifically correct way so that I'm prepared for the next steps. These are the problems I stay up at night thinking. Cool. Cool. Katie, what's difficult about robotics? So, you know, yeah. <laughs> even like without generative AI. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's easier to say what isn't difficult. Yeah, that's a, that's a, good, <laughs> a good thing. Um, uh, so I think outlining the challenges of robotics is very hard because um, in some places robotics is like its own department. So I think uh, different people have different perspectives on what the key challenges are, what's most important. But I think broadly as a field, a lot of what people have been pushing towards is trying to get things out of a controlled lab setting, and in general, thinking about how we can push these systems that we're building out into the real world. Um, and kind of building on that last point, a lot of what we've been doing, or, or one of the core things that people have been thinking about is really how to think of the complete system. Um, I think uh, in robotics, there's lots of different modules and lots of different things that go come into play. Um, and it used to be that people could be very siloed and isolated in one specific area, and now it's becoming much more uh, systems-oriented where you kind of have to have a good understanding of everything. So I think a lot of the key challenges is thinking about the interplay between all of these different modules and your whole complete system from things like the perception system down to the hardware and limitations there, and then dealing with the real world. Um, so that's one of the big things, dealing with um, the challenges in the real world, so how do you handle things like uh, not knowing what's going to happen out there and not being able to model all of that um, a priori, um, and uh, really thinking about things like making it usable and thinking about end, those end use cases. So a lot of robotics starts from an end application, thinks about the hard challenges, and that motivates a lot of the, the core research questions. So at a very high level, I think those are some of the, the big picture things. Cool. Cool. Lana, what about vision? Um, I think for now I'll hold my fire and I'll be brief. So I'll just say the key challenge of computer vision is to understand scenes and 
actually what it means to understand scenes? I would say the key challenge in speech is that people are very creative. So if I were to build a system that could correctly transcribe um, every word that has been spoken in the English language from the dawn of history until today, by tomorrow it would be out of date. Um, and this is a uh, this is a problem in particular for industry because um, one of the things that people really like to talk to smart speakers about is to um, order products or to order movies. Um, but proper names are, are um, very difficult to, to correctly transcribe, especially when the proper name has never appeared in public discourse prior to the, the day that you deploy your device. Right, and when, pe when companies like to use really interesting spellings and so on. Yeah. 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 And not, not to mention the fact that um, may, maybe, as, maybe as late as 2005, 2010, the internet was English, and, and that's no longer true. The, um, the, the, uh, the diversity of languages that are used by the people of the world is starting to be found also among the people who use uh, speech recognition devices. Right. right. And what about synthesis going the other way? Um, same problems. Same problems, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. So um, um, I guess we are, we are all aware that generative AI is sort of huge. There's a lot of hype in the media and like real, real successes, real breakthroughs. And, and I'd like to understand how those breakthroughs have sort of affected your individual fields, right? So, so how has that sort of, sort, of, sort of changed your field? How is it sort of transforming what you're working on? What's become easier? You know, yeah. That's it, you know, yeah. Uh, I, I would say as a core ML person, this is, it's just a fascinating development, right? So you will find probably 15-year-old talks by me talking about variational inference and the same tools, right? We have been in this, right? And, and it is fascinating what our field has pulled off. There's, I think we are declaring victory too early. There's a lot we don't know, right? The, the core statistical computational constraint and applied questions. I think the successes have gone in vision and language processing. For the rest of us who are not working on vision and language processing, I still don't know how to generate Atlantic hurricanes in a scientifically correct way, <laughs> synthetically, right? The Boston mayor's office, New York City mayor's office are worried, are we going to get a category four storm in the next 20 years? Can you do generative AI to solve this? No, 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 we can't. We have to do a lot more, another five to seven years of research before we can actually start scratching the surface. So I have to say the development has been fascinating, but there's a long way to go. I think for all of us, I would, I would assume that no field will say this has solved the problem we, want, we are interested in. I want to hear what others have to say. Um, so I was actually, I was on a, uh, a debate in, it was the robot learning workshop at NeurIPS last year. And the debate was uh, like, you had to be like pro or against, wouldn't you, I guess you were assigned, is will generative AI revolutionize robotics? And it was like the worst debate to be on because no one believed that it wouldn't. So it was a really <laughs> awful, like one-sided thing, even though they put some people on it. It was, uh, it was uh, I think it's, so it's broadly agreed that it's going to have, be very impactful on, on robotics. And, and broadly speaking, I think uh, when you think about the whole robotics uh, pipeline, you know, you have perception down to decision-making, planning, control, um, a lot of these areas have a ton of overlap with AI, and a lot of the developments in you know, pure AI have been trickling down and do impact. So it's been very, uh, very telling and very interesting watching AI and then see it translate to, uh, to robotics. Um, a lot of the big challenges, though, are is with a lot of the big models and big things that have come out, they uh, are powered by the fact that you have tons of computation and you have tons of data. And when you have... Uh, the physical world that you're really interacting with, even if you collect large data sets, it's just not the same. So there's still a pretty big gap between being able to use and deploy these models and see sort of that physical interaction with the real world. So um, even though there's no doubt that there's going to be a, like a huge impact and there's like a clear role in how, how it changes and influence how everything happens, um, I think there's still this like pretty big gap in dealing with that, that physical, physical aspect. Lana? Um, you know, so I think generative AI has revolutionized computer vision for sure. Um, it's hard to get 
you know, for me to get my head around it yet. I don't know exactly what the impact is. I know it's huge. Um, I can't understand it. Um, in some ways, the earlier developments of deep learning were sort of easy to assimilate because we saw them coming for decades. Um, they just made problems that we were working on for a very long time work much better, but that's where we always said we wanted to end up. We wanted, you know, um, image classification to work much better, image segmentation, object detection. So at first, deep networks came along and did all that. Um, so that was exciting, but we saw it coming from a long way away. But now the ability to generate the kinds of images that we see with diffusion models where you can specify any crazy combination of objects, properties, concepts, and it does a reasonable job. Like you can generate, you know, the Pope in a Balenciaga coat. You can generate penguins and Christmas sweaters playing hockey on Mars. Um, I still don't know why it works. Um, and what it means. In some way, you know, we would have thought that by the time we ended up at the point where we have methods that can generate those kinds of images, we will really have understood everything. And this is, I think, probably the old-fashioned AI mindset, um, that in order to get AI to do some task, it means that we first really need to understand it ourselves. Um, and we've ended up in a place where basically we have amazing results, but we don't know if there's understanding there. So um, this is kind of what I'm grappling with. Yeah, I guess uh, I would maybe echo everything that Lana just said sort of from the, the speech, speech point of view. I mean, in a sense, we've had large language modeling in speech since the 1970s. Uh, there, there, uh, Steve Levinson had this, this series of experiments at Bell Labs called How May I Help You? The premise of which was that um, the, the largest part of automatic speech recognition is knowing in advance what the person is going to say. And um, you know, we had better and better predictions of what the person was going to say. People started generating text using these models and putting it through speech synthesizers in the, in the early 2000s. Um, and the, the models kept getting, you know, neural network language models came out sometime around then. Um, even, as, even as recently as 2016, people were using, you know, these um, fairly large parametrized, by, that, by 2017, transformer models to generate text. Um, and then something happened around 2021. There was this little company that decided to increase the parameter count from 40 billion to 400 billion parameters. Why not? You know, it's just we've got the processor power. And suddenly it went from um, we can generate sentences that almost sound human to um, we can generate essays that sound as if they were written by a person with a bachelor's degree. Um, I was at a at, at a, a, um, a panel in in March where I, th I think it was Hal Domey said something along the lines of then the the aliens came down from heaven and gave us a black box that we still haven't quite figured out. And, and we're still kind of grappling with that, that simply by increasing the number of parameters in exactly the same architecture by a factor of 10, it went from being um, almost something that you could say is not too bad to being something that's better than average human performance. Um, we're not quite sure what to do with that yet. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, when you brought up hurricanes, right? I thought, yeah, you know, I mean, like uh, in natural language, right? So, um, um, chit chat is kind of easy, right? Story generation is easy, right? Because you can basically say whatever you want, right? But right? whereas, I mean, like actually getting these, pay, you know, so and like essays, like creative writing, right? I mean, you know, I was talking to 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 a colleague who works in creative writing, right? And they're scared. They're really scared, right? But but I think. Um, actually writing like like scientific papers that actually sort of you know are actually sort of correct and true and whatever right you know you know that's sort of like uh, like uh, modeling a hurricane right you know you know I still think we're very far from that right yeah. which which makes it fun to be working on the types of areas some of us are focusing on because it has uh, I, I think we need to understand because it's a black box, right? If you understood how those things are working, we, the transfer to an end. I'm using Atlantic hurricanes as an example because I have been struggling with this for the last two years. There are many other projects we have been successful, but we are realizing the difficulty of this. I'm sure many of you will be able to come up with examples like this, like video generation where things are physically making sense, right? So, you know, if somebody hits a pole and falls following physical laws, hits a ball that rolls around and so on and so forth. 
So you have to up the game a little bit uh, for these cases, but I'm giving a concrete example which has real applications. Uh, but uh, there is no argument, it is a, it is a black box. I mean, I, I teach a course on this stuff and, and I mean that part is still a mystery. We can tell you exactly what the algorithm is, uh, but why it's working is the part that we are unclear on because of over um, which some of us in theory are trying to figure out. What is this magic of massive over which is enabling things. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very fascinating theory topic that right. some of us are working on. Right. Many of us are actually working on. What about evaluation of these models? I'll go last maybe. Yeah, okay, I, I, have I mean like, yeah. So like, like in your domain, how do you evaluate these models? It's like. I don't have an answer for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a big challenge in robotics, especially yes. because I guess, uh, one of the key things that I mentioned in robotics is you do have this like physical interaction. So you really have to consider things like safety. So this is like a huge concern for a lot of companies. Like so uh, for example, autonomous vehicle companies, they are, you know, jumping on the LLM bag wagon, they're trying to figure out how they can inject it in, have better like understanding of what's going on, understand the human parts, things like that. But they can put it in their system, but then there's like this this challenge, like how do you deal with hallucinations? How do you detect when there is something that is fundamentally wrong with the model or if it's something that's actually going weird in the real world? Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, even just validating any robotic system is already a huge challenge. That's already like a very active research area and just adding more complexity and then something that has even more, uh, I guess it generates its own kinds of uncertainties is a big, big open, open problem there. I guess the uh, the uh, du dual of of, um, of uh, reliability or safety for, for for speech and language would be fairness, which is maybe we've got a slightly better handle on it than, uh, uh, but um, but it's still a, a challenging problem that suddenly has come to the fore with the advent of um, pre-trained speech recognizers and pre-trained large language models because the data that they're pre-trained on is um, is you know. LibriVox.org, essentially. It's people who feel like they, for, some, for one reason or another, they want to um, narrate an audiobook. And so the, the, the uh, pre-trained um, automatic speech recognizers will work very, very well on people who sound like the kind of people who would volunteer to read an audiobook online. And everybody else in the world doesn't get the same benefit. And it's become almost an empirical science. We, the, the way that we're approaching it is by um, getting samples of speech from people who might sound a little bit different in some way because they have cerebral palsy or because they speak um, a socioeconomically disadvantaged dialect um, or because they're talking, talking about a topic that's not covered in those books and getting those samples and putting it into the speech recognizer and seeing what comes out and taking the average. And then when we find, we've, we've, uh, we've actually just, um, just submitted for a publication a, a sort of a statistical test that tests, you know, given all of the other things that can vary, is this actually a significant difference in the performance of this recognizer between um, between this group of people and this group of people, and then if it is, the next question will be, what can you do about it? And that's sort of where the uh, the next research one of the next research topics is. But so I guess that brings me to my next question. So sorry, I was going oh, to no, no, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So as far as evaluating image generation, that's also a really complicated problem because you're generating images that never existed before for crazy text prompts. So how do you tell if the results are good or not? How do you compare results? So academics, of course, are very fond of coming up with evaluation metrics, automatic evaluation, you know, human evaluation protocols, having people look at outputs of different systems and rate them. Um, so as an academic writing a paper, I have to scratch my head a lot if I want to get it accepted. And there is almost reviewers, they want to see numbers. It almost doesn't matter what kind of numbers, they want tables of numbers. And if somebody in Events an automatic metric, um, you know, whether or not it has serious issues, a lot of times they get adopted and then you kind of have to keep computing these things even if you don't believe them. So it's becoming kind of exhausting. I feel like we need to, you know, learn to stop worrying and maybe move more towards real world applications and more practically relevant scenario or things that people care about in the real world. Um, and, you know, worry less about writing papers papers in the future. So there was a CVPR panel on um, basically the uses of generative 
AI, like language image generation. Um, so an artist was on the panel, Jason Sullivan. He has been doing digital art for you know several decades. And he said something that I liked a lot. He said, artists don't care about evaluation. Just give us some <laughs> tools, let us play around with them, let us do things that we will find interesting. So I thought, oh, this is actually, this takes so much pressure off. Like if we care about creative AI, let's just you know come up with some things, give them to artists, see what they do with it. Um, or just give it to random people on the internet. Of course, sometimes then they might do very disturbing things, but that's already a, a different topic. Uh, maybe a couple of remarks. I, I think synthetic data sets will have a role, like you, you construct a distribution sample from it, try to see if you can reconstruct. But to, to uh, this point, I think some of the scientific applications, they, there is a truth, right? So, so if you want to create risk maps of forest fires in the United States, like by a county by county map, um, uh, scientifically there is a true distribution of risk maps and a high risk, low risk, and so on. NOAA is tasked with releasing various kinds of three-month forecasts, so, and physical laws have to be. Uh, evaluation is, is a horror story, right? So I don't have a solution there. I, I, I think it's different from the rabbit uh, galloping on Mars because this is real. This affects people's life. An entire island can burn out in front of your eyes because you did not know this island was at risk. So, so yeah, I, I hope this so much brains now focusing on these more creative parts of it. I really hope we can get some of them to focus on the things, uh, the real world problems as, as, as Lana was mentioning because we, we are very thin over here. We, very few of us are working on it. And it can have a huge impact in, 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 in the society. Right. So I guess that brings me to my next question. Right? So, so what new problems are now becoming important right? now that, that stuff actually works or works at a level that it didn't work before? Right? I mean, perhaps it can't satisfy Arinda, but it can satisfy some artists and creative writers. And, uh, yeah. or. I, I think I have brought out at least a few of these things that uh, uh, currently we don't have a way of make, making generative models work. At least we have to trust them. So there's work to be done. And understanding the black box is hopefully going to be a big part of it. At least as academics, we like that part if we can make progress on it. It seems hard, but we'll keep trying. Uh, but I think I have given at least a couple of examples, things like forest fires, generative models for forest fires, what's realistic, what to expect in the next five years over the world, Atlantic hurricanes. We have not uh, uh, crop yields based on heat waves and climate change. We want generative models for them, right? We want to simulate the future world in the next 20 years so that decision makers, policy makers can simulate and make decisions. Uh, I hope we get all of the brains who have really made tremendous progress on these other areas to start focusing on some of these problems. Uh, there are unique challenges there because uh, conservation laws and scientific laws, momentum conversations, uh, PDEs have to be satisfied. So, so it constrains the output space quite a bit and, and, those, and that's going on. I mean, I should not say many, many folks in our community are starting to f go full steam on this. So we'll probably see that in the next three to five years. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm seeing that there are enough open problems that we want gen to bring the generative AI success to uh, in the scientific and societal problem domain. Um, <clears throat> so I think in robotics, people are still playing with it and kind of seeing where and how it will change things. I think a lot of people are, <clears throat> again, using them in place of things like uh, the different modules that kind of affect wherever they are and playing around with it. So I think a lot of it is still... Uh, still to be seen how it will have its biggest effect. I think some of the things that have recent success that people have been playing with a lot lately have been um, having these uh, large models generate code. So you can have basically uh, these like code as policies. So instead of doing end-to-end -end learning or something like that, you can actually just have things like generate code for you. Um, and there's some advantages to this because it's like human interpretable, so you can kind of see what's coming out and sort of parse things a little bit. Um, and so there's been a lot of interest in in using things there. Um, the other thing is, um, as was just mentioned, uh, coming up with simulators is really important as we start thinking about how to better uh, create our robots and test them before putting them out in the real world and hopefully doing a better job and sort of closing that uh, gap between the simulation and the, the real world. So there's um, a lot of opportunity there, but as I mentioned before, there's still um, just not enough data of 
sort of real world stuff. And the the investment it takes to really get that is pretty high. So um, uh, there's like those videos from uh, Google Robotics where they just had rows and rows of robot arms, like doing a simple task of like opening a door. And they just had this robot doing the same thing. Um, it's just not feasible for every task you might want your robot to do. So um, I think there's hope there, but it's still still a gap. Um, so I could, I mean, I've been sitting here yeah, every, every minute or two, I come up with a new topic, so I could come up with three. The, the one that I'm working actively on is, is fairness, is the, the, the problem that um, ASR works well for some people and not others, and that's, um, that's at, at that point, um, engineers are making the world a worse place by exacerbating inequalities that already exist, and so we want to try to find ways to make that less true, to, to make um, ASR work better for for very, people who are very young or people who have speech, uh, speech impairments or uh, people who speak socioeconomically disadvantaged dialects. Um, the second problem is maybe not really a speech problem or a large language model problem. The, um, the obvious application when ASR works really, really well for everybody is that um, you won't talk to a device, you'll talk to an agent that exists across all of your devices and that agent will, you know, will have a name. You'll, you might have five or six um, personal secretaries that you can call on, de on demand anywhere you are um, on any set of devices that you happen to be close to and that will, um, they will be specialized for particular kinds of information retrieval for you. Um, but in order for that to happen, we need a lot better data security than we have right now. Um, the, the, the principles are in place. I mean, actually, the principles were solved for us by a bunch of lawmakers in Europe who said, you know, um, everybody owns their own data, and, um, and companies can be fined up to 2% of their gross worldwide profit every, um, for, for, for violating that principle. Right, so that, that's, that, that's in place, and the, and the only problem is that um, now the, the companies have basically said, oh, in that case, we're not going to do anything with data. Um, so to get to a world where everybody has five or six personal assistants on demand anywhere they are, regardless of which devices they happen to be close to, we have to have some kind of data sharing protocol that actually satisfies GDPR, that satisfies um, the user giving, giving the user control over their own data. And I think that's a prerequisite. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who disagree, but I would say that's a prerequisite for the third big application, and that is automatic diagnosis diagnosis. Um, you know, there's, there's a result come out last week that you can actually diagnose diabetes from the voice. You can diabetes, definitely you can, di you can do very early diagnosis of autism and Parkinson's disease. You can um, detect, you, you can measure the degree of a number of, of um, developmental and congenital disorders uh, within the first couple of years of life from the voice. Um, all of that data is available to you and um, and a lot of additional research could be done in that data, but it's never going to have an effect if people don't trust it. And so we need to find some way of making that kind of technology trustworthy to the user before the users will be willing to, to use it. Or, or make sure that, that we actually have their consent. Right? I, mean, like, I mean, like, I guess the flip side is, so let's say your insurance company has your voice um, records, right? right? And suddenly they say, oh, you might you might have diabetes or whatever, right? I'm not going to give you insurance, right? Right, that's right? the, I mean, that's like, the that's nightmare scenario. That's sort of the flip side, right? Oh. I would say it's, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I, 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 I'm not sure if this is actually possible. Certainly the insurance companies are going to fight me tooth and nail, but I would say that it's a lot stronger than consent. I would say that it's ownership. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah that exactly. You, you own your voice and everything that's computed from your voice, and nobody else should get permission to see it right. unless you yeah, give yeah, them yeah, exactly. to say, here, doctor, can you please take a look at this and tell me what this is? And then in that, at that point, your doctor gets to look at it, but the other doctors working for the same hospital don't. Right. right? So giving, giving, giving the user um, uh, very, you know, the permission to draw red lines around the people who, who actually get to see their data. That's what's specified in GDPR, um, but the, the um, American medical in, uh, insurance industry certainly, um, you know, that basically robs them of, of the data that they need to, to go on with. Right. right. And I guess that's so you're talking about sort of once we have these models, how do we use them and deploy them, right? But in order to actually create these models, right? I mean, like typically all sorts of copyright laws have been broken to actually sort of get them to the performance that they, that they have, right? But in many cases, just because... Because, yeah. because maybe these maybe claim. Lana could talk about that if she wants to. I mean, that's <laughs> that that's actually being d discussed in court right now. I think yeah, how, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly how many copyright laws have been broken. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, we yeah. So 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 what does all of this mean for us as academics, right? How do we do research in this sort of new world, right, where we have all these huge models that come out 
in industry, right? Of course, there's like a new model every week or something like that, right? But how do we keep up? How do we do, re do research? What does it mean to do good science in this sort of environment, in this sort of new sort of world that we're in? Maybe a comment on that, not yeah. an answer. Yes, yes. Uh, there's there's um, some papers that have come out recently that seem like they're pretty impactful. They get a lot of attention. Um, and they're kind of along these lines of what I mentioned before, like basically generating code to deploy things. So this was like an example on Minecraft where they're basically coming up with a way to basically solve long horizon tasks so they can start basically with nothing, plop an agent in, and it will basically learn how to construct really interesting, crazy things. Um, and it's kind of interesting because it basically comes down to prompt engineering. Um, and other than, I guess, knowing some technical things, there's basically, there's, you don't need a graduate degree to, to do this. Uh, it, it's, it was like, became a research paper, but there was things that didn't feel researchy from an academic right. sense. So I think there's this kind of push and pull between now trying to do just cool things that we haven't been able to do with really seeking, like, what is that, like, foundational understanding that we as academics are hopefully searching for and trying to do, um, but at the same time needing to compete with them. So um, that's just more of a, an observation, <laughs> no solutions. Yeah, in the, in, in the early 2000s, we, 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 we used to say that there was no way anymore to do automatic speech recognition research in academia because there were two or three companies that had the best systems and nobody else had them. And then this really weird thing happened in the late 2010s. All those companies started giving away their models, including the trained parameters. Um, so it, it became a matter of publicity, actually. Uh, you know, this, this fantastic publicity stunt that you're a, you're a large, one of the big five tech companies or big six tech companies or whatever. Um, how do you make your, how do, how do you recruit the best possible graduate students? Well, while they're still graduate students, you give them your, your code. And, um, and uh, so it's, it's actually quite a good time to be in research in, in speech and language processing right now, I think, because a lot because there, there is this motivation, at least for right now, for the companies to give away not their very best model, but a, a model that's um, dramatically better than anything that you could train on an academic budget. The other part of that, of course, is that we don't have the GPUs to run them efficiently, so we have to kind of mix and match various GPUs and various combinations in order to actually get the, get the model to run. But, um, but it's, I think it's quite a good time to be in research. Right. Um, but how do we get from running models to actually the sort of understanding that like Lana and Katie have been yeah. you know, sort of you know, alluding to? Yeah, by, by having good reviewers. <laughs> okay, good luck with that. <laughs> well, you know, maybe I will introduce a note of pessimism. As a researcher in computer vision, I personally am pretty worried. Um, I'm also a pessimist by nature, but anyway, I think it's good. There's way too much optimism, I think, <laughs> especially in the U.S. We always have to be optimistic, so I'm just going to lean into my pessimism. I am quite worried. I don't think that I can do the kind of research that I've been accustomed to doing, where you identify a problem, you think of a model, you implement the model, you know, you train it, you evaluate it, you report on your findings. Um, I think for huge chunks of what used to be defined as computer vision, we cannot do that anymore because, you know, the state of the art basically belongs to models that are trained at such a scale that we cannot even approach it. Um, so at best, we basically have to rely on the goodwill of Meta or whoever to release some version of their model, uh, hope that we can download the weights and maybe fine tune them, maybe do some um, prompt engineering, um, do something or other, you know, to get a submission out. Um, you know, the other thing that is very worrying is the speed of the cycle. Once again, for an academic, it's all great for sort of general progress of technology, but for an academic, for an advisor of students, uh, cycle time has just become too fast. It is impossible to be in control of your own research agenda. You know, almost anything you can come up with, at least in, you know, relatively popular research areas, it 
can be appended, you know, tomorrow by somebody posting something on archive. You know, so I think a lot of students are just checking archive every night. They're very stressed out. Um, you know, I supervise students on projects. Every week there's some new model relevant to what they're trying to do, and they're like, oh, actually now I need to compare to this, or I need to swap out components for this new thing, or, you know, whatever idea I had, now something came out that works way better. Of course, everything is very resource intensive. Research is increasingly done by large teams. So I think all of this makes it hard to do research as we used to know it. Uh, <clears throat> that's very, very well said. That's a concern. I, I think the, this is driving research in a direction, probably narrowing the scope of what, you know, what research in academia should look like. I, I, I think we should be, ideally we are used to thinking of you know, the, the mode of we are used to working with. I, I would still stay from the ML perspective. Uh, we do we want to understand the black box, right? So, so, so the fact that deep learning over parameterized model, generative AI, these things are actually working so well and sometimes they fail disastrously, they hallucinate out of control, they generate garbage. We have to understand the black box, and that's a good goal for ML, right? And we want to do both statistical and computational work in that context. So I think this will keep us busy. Hopefully, we'll be able to understand the black box at least in some part. I'll give you an like, out-there example. If you think, if you stretch yourselves a little bit, theoretical physicist is trying to understand a system that is like open AI code, not shared with you. You will only can poke the system and say, oh, water is flowing, maybe there's gravity and this and that, right? So, so in some ways, the ML theorists are partly becoming like theoretical physicists, that they are trying to poke and understand the system that they, it's so big and so complex uh, that they do not have access to the every line of the code, right? So in that sense, I, I think the ML theory part of it that some of us are engaged in is very much alive, just like theoretical physics is alive. We fundamentally want to understand what's going on. And that's a good pursuit to have, be, being an academic. That's something universities should do. Right. Uh, I, I warned you it's an out there example, but I, you can probably see a little bit of uh, semblance in there. The other is that there are, there are real world applications which cannot be immediate, immediately monetized. So the open AIs and the metas are not interested in, these are the problems I'm telling you about. Right. There is no competition there. Right. You want to create risk maps for forest fires, there is, very few people are working on it. They are very passionate, but we do not have the resources uh, or the brains of the people in there. So pick good problems, right? You may be able to do fascinating high impact research uh, to, to keep track of crop yields, Atlantic hurricanes, climate extremes, and so on and so forth. I'm really hoping to lure away some of the super smart language, speech, and vision people into start focusing on these problems. There is data. I mean, I mean, our, our team has been working on something very big, global scale, uh, spatial, temporal things. It's in GitHub. We have 2,000 followers, and so on and so forth. So, so some of us are running these projects, slowly ramping up. But the good thing is there is no immediate way to monetizing this. So right. governments are investing it. Some individual academics are investing it. These problems are wide open. So, and you can have a huge impact by making progress on this. If you are targeting LLMs and core computer vision, this in the CVPR and community, you will not get sleep. I can imagine that. It's, it's just every night archive gets this dump of papers and GitHub gets these updates. It's just I I feel bad for graduate students and undergrads who are trying to get into research. It's it's very scary. Yeah. yeah. So I agree with Arindam about. Um, you know, the advantage of finding applications <laughs> that have not yet attracted the attention of the big companies. Um, but as far as the physics analogy, though, I I'm not quite sure about it. You know, the one nice thing about physics is that laws of physics don't change. I was, I was going to say exactly as that. As opposed yeah. to black boxes that we might try to understand, the black box will probably be different tomorrow, and whatever we think we understood will be useless. Yes, yes, I was going to say the exact same thing. Unless you somehow manage to dig down to some level of abstraction where you are looking at some core principles of ML that are, you know, analogous to laws of physics, but um, as far as I know, ML theory has not gotten there yet. Or, or in our case, to, to some principle of the, of the distribution of data on the internet, right? So if you do 
I mean, there, there's a lot of talk of doing social science research using large language models, and a lot of what I do in, in fairness for speech recognition is basically social science research using large language models. What is the distribution of people on the internet? We have no idea, but actually we do, because we've got the models that were trained on that distribution. I guess that really defines what research is, right, in this case, social science research. Right, yeah. Um, we, we only have like five minutes left on the, you know, I guess we can open it for questions from the floor. We do have to stop um, um, at 5.30, so, yeah, in the back. Alex? I see, uh, now it works. And maybe a slightly controversial point. I, I heard we need to understand the black box quite a few times. Now, uh, I'm wondering, do we really need to? And I guess the reason for my question is, do we really need to understand, or do we really understand how humans work? I would make the point, we probably don't understand the brain, yet we can collaborate together, work together. Do we need to understand these systems? Or can we rather define boundaries for these systems within which they can execute and do whatever they want to do? There's, there's different definitions of the word understand, right? I mean, in, in, in machine learning theory, we're accustomed to understand in the sense that we know exactly what the error surface is. But um, in my field, I'm used, accustomed to thinking of the word understand in the sense of um, understanding why that word took on that particular meaning or what are the, what are the groups of actors who, 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 whose conversation caused that word to take on that particular meaning. That, that level of understand, I think, is still highly relevant even when, um, even, even when the parameters are not published. Also, I mean, like, I, I'm probably half this campus is engaged in trying to understand how humans work. So I do think it's an interesting <laughs> research problem. Or I'm perhaps not that a whole litany of problems, right? But I think, yeah, I'm not sure if we should entirely give up on understanding it from a machine learning point of view either. Yeah. yeah. Another question? Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. I guess I have a question and a comment. Um, I think what uh, Lana said earlier was very interesting. It's the point that we sort of expected these models to do well on ImageNet, you know, in 2010 or something. Or at least it wasn't like that surprising that they could do well on ImageNet. And then they did something which we completely goes kind of beyond all expectations, like last couple of years. Which actually makes me wonder, um, did we really understand what they were doing? I, I, would, I, I would sort of well, maybe not, right? Because if they did well on ImageNet, which was expected, and then they did the same kind of things, did something later on which wasn't expected, that means that we never understood in the first place, and there was some sort of illusion of understanding. <laughs> and that actually goes back to the point about uh, some sort of laws of physics, and I think that's what we need. We need a law of physics for the thing that's clearly governed by some sort of pattern in natural data which exists for texts, for speech, for vision, for maybe biology, I, I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing this out. It's not a question as such, but... Uh. Yeah, um, so I think I did not um, sort of express myself quite precisely. Um, so I did not mean to imply that, oh, you know, we expected up front that once neural networks got big enough, they would do well on all these tasks. We didn't know what would do well, but this was our stated goal. We had these tasks we were working on for several decades, like image classification, you know, image segmentation, you know, object detection, all the sort of classic uh, recognition tasks. And it was our stated goal to get, you know, very good, ideally human levels of performance on these tasks. And if we're in this field, we do have to believe that we're going to make progress and get there. We didn't know what it would be, but the fact that eventually we did make progress and get very good levels of performance up front, you know, everyone in the field would be satisfied by that. Yes, we succeeded to a good degree. But then all of a sudden these other tasks came out that people barely thought about because it was assumed it was way too hard. Um, 
And, you know, that to me is even more mind-boggling. But of course, yes, I should not claim that uh, it was totally obvious to everyone that something like AlexNet would, you know, achieve a breakthrough or whatever. And I, I'm not implying that you said that it was obvious. No, I mean, I, I'm just yeah. saying that there is a gap in um, the sort of index of surprise, right? Yeah, so at the time it was absolutely surprising and some um, famous members of the community were quite skeptical. Um, you know, there are some famous debates that happened between Jan LeCun and Jitendra Malik and Alyosha Efres and so on. Um, Jitendra and Alyosha were a bit skeptical in the beginning, uh, but then, you know, after a couple of years they were pretty convinced. So maybe a quick remark. I'm, I'm thinking Alex's earlier comment. Um, so, so I think not understanding it fully should not prevent us from using it for the stuff that we are trying to do. So this should be part of our thing. But I also think that if I produce a pigeon, which is picking tomorrow's weather and it's been mostly correct for the last two weeks, as a scientist, we, we have to start, whoa, how is the pigeon picking the right weather most of the time, right? So, so in a way, that, that's how we all think like that, right? So, so, and we may not be able to, maybe the pigeon is not a pigeon, it's some robot which is connected to weather.com and so on. So I'm seeing that that is the part of the investigation we do, and, but it should in no way prevent us till we fully understand that these systems are too complex and they're working. You can't debate with experimental res results, right? So and they are public code, right? So you can run it yourself. So yeah, but, but you have to balance the two. I, I, I think that's the right way, yeah. Um, so unfortunately, we're at the end of our uh, 45 minutes. So um, uh, thank you very much. This has been really, really fun. Um, yeah, um, so I'd like to thank our panelists. And yeah, I have lots of thoughts, but I think we need to take them offline. So. Yeah.